today our guest is Jack McAuley. He was a co-founder of Oculus VR and also former chef engineering at that company. Today he's a professor at, uh, at Berkeley and he's working on like fascinating things. Uh, and, and he will talk about what exactly he, he's working, but today we'll like the, the focus will be on applications of AI on uh, electric vehicle efficiency and optimization. Uh, Jack, thanks thanks a lot for, for joining this talk. Thank you, uh, Sophia, and, and thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Um, and today's topic, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a video game engineer by trade. I work in entertainment. Um, I worked in entertainment for 40 years. I'm now not working in entertainment. I work on vehicle stuff, so which is really what I was interested in, but like driving games and racing games and things like that, I, I really like those. So um, I was also the chief engineer and uh, chief engineer on Guitar Hero, which was a popular video game about 10 or 15 years ago for Activision. Um, it's interesting because I get gigs based on my past relationships. Um, I got Oculus because of my relationship with some of the principal people at Activision, some of the executives who referred me to these young guys coming in looking to build headsets. So that's the way it works for me. I got the gig at Math Institute, Berkeley. I'm a trustee, a board member of a math institute from a guy I worked with in, in the late 80s working on Terminator 2, the movie, I did the sound system, control stuff for that. So that's how it sort of played out. I got the gig at Berkeley because the guy, I'm the trustee at the university, also the guy that I worked with at, on Guitar Hero got me that gig. So that's the way it played out. And I'm also competent. I got, I could do the work. So uh, for to a large degree, it's because of the human relationships that I ended up um, where I am today. So I'm a very fortunate person. So let's, let's uh, get down to brass tacks here and talk a little bit about this is right along the lines of what I teach at UC Berkeley. Um, I teach mobility engineering and mobility engineering is uh, electric vehicles essentially and all the components that go into it, software and so forth. I My focus is on uh, the vehicle uh, uh, motor and uh, drive drive system and drivetrain. I'm also, um, uh, you know, co-teach the battery component of it and to a degree. So, and the autonomy and route optimization, I'm very familiar with that. I'm, those are my topics today, but I'm going to add the motor control. I'm going to tell you what's going on in powertrains and, and particularly with efficiency. So um, the companies that uh, invested heavily, but let me just go back and talk about Twitter for a minute, because this is a, this is a point I'm going to make about uh, investing in companies. So Twitter in the, since 2012, the last 10 years has had two years in which they've made a profit, two out of 10 years. They have consecutively lost money. And the, the reason is, is that, um, first of all, their, their user growth is fairly slow. Uh, they have about maybe 300 million users compared to Facebook's 3 billion. And now from... Uh, a customer or user perspective, Facebook has done everything right and Twitter's done everything wrong. The, the problem with Twitter is just a bad business model. It doesn't work. And um, there's so much uh, negativity on it, it drives advertisers away. And so uh, when you talk about route optimization and guidance, there are plenty of companies working on this. It's just not a good business. Uh, if you're going to do it from a business perspective. It's also a really, really tough problem to solve. If you have a delivery system, like let's say you're Amazon and you want to figure out and you have an electric truck, which they have now, Amazon is coming out with electric delivery trucks, which consists of a lithium ion battery pack and an electric motor um, on the floor. And then it's got this open space and so forth. So you can put cargo in there. When you're talking about that, problem um there's a there's a really really great business opportunity for people that are working on route optimization and guidance and the reason is is that when you run out of electricity on a delivery truck you you've got problems and um so if you could um using routing route optimization reduce the uh, number of effective kilowatt hours that's the battery capacity used during um a trip um you could um very easily um, um, 
sell that idea to somebody like Amazon. So if I were going to do a company in that area, that's what I would work on. Routing the routing algorithm, routing problem exists in in different technologies, on on circuit boards and semiconductors. Routing the traces for the little wires that are printed on the circuit board from one point to another is very very difficult to do. It's a really really tough problem to solve. Um, you can get to it to a degree, but you'll never find the perfect solution. So routing basically puts a little wire on the circuit board or the, on the chip and connects it to another chip on board. And uh, this is a really, really difficult problem to solve. So it's the same problem that exists for um, uh, electrification and, and vehicle optimization, uh, route op optimization. It's the same problem. So that that is a, an area that um, is rich for um, a growth um, and also would be a very, very good um, thing to have for, uh, excuse me, my phone is on here. Uh, you know, a very good thing for someone like Amazon. So if I do in a startup company, Right now, I would I would definitely look at that as as a as selling a key component of that company to somebody like Amazon. We sold our business to Facebook. I worked as a co-founder of Oculus. We sold the business to Facebook. Um, we were actually Oculus was actually making money its first year. We were in the black, which means that the product was generating enough revenue to sustain us. Um, so it appeared to be a market a market for it, and and Mark Zuckerberg bought the business from us. Um, not because we had, uh, you know, a, a huge amount of software for it, but because he thought there was a, a growth opportunity for Facebook in this particular, and he also likes the product. Um, so if you're going to build a company, let's say for routing optimization and guidance, I would definitely um, focus on a, a buyer, is which is what we did uh, at Oculus. We focused on, on Facebook because uh, one of the guys at Andreessen Horowitz, which is a VC firm, um, knew um, Mark Zuckerberg <clears throat> because they funded Facebook also and knew that we could get a seat at the table to show them our stuff. So this is the, an area um, that is a really hard problem to solve, a very difficult problem, not easy, uh, but will allow uh, you to produce um, a business which you can flip. So that's my sort of take on it. Um, I don't I don't think it's an easy problem to solve. Any Everybody who's worked on this and, and the autonomy group um, of problems has not succeeded very well. Um, and so the next topic is, of course, autonomy. Um, autonomous driving, essentially, there's different levels of autonomous uh, uh, driving. Uh, you know, level one is a very basic level, which has sensors on the car that put the brakes on when you are uh, pulling in or give you a warning, rather, that, that you're pulling in. Uh, level two would actually apply a braking force to it. And so on level four is complete autonomy. Um, and again, this is a, another really difficult problem to solve. And Tesla's approach um, is, is a little different than the other people, but it's just very, very tough. Um, and if I were going to build a business um, and, and try to sell this business uh, to somebody like General Motors, um, I, 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 it's a long haul and it's expensive. And you would, you could very well end up like, like Twitter of doing it for 10 years and burning through money, like investors' money. So uh, these are really, really tough problems. As far as the AI aspect of this, um, here's some thoughts that I had, and this is a technical thing. There's something called uh, simultaneous lo localization and, and mapping, which takes a camera system and let's say you're driving down the road and maps the road out and feeds that into the cloud. So subsequent cars that are moving uh, down the road have a map of what's in the road and the current road conditions. Let's say there's a lane blocked on the highway to the right. Well, SLAM could keep track of that. Um, Microsoft, uh, a couple of years back, five or six years ago, had a pretty pretty aggressive um, SLAM program. SLAM, SLAM is software um, and, and succeeded somewhat for room scale VR. But it, for the greater part of this, you're going to need connectivity to uh, cellular networks and cloud services, so forth, in order to get a, a mapping, um, of, you know, of what is in front of the vehicle. So uh, that's that's another thing. That this is a, if you had complete high level autonomy, you're going to need um, some sort of localization and mapping to keep road conditions and so forth. There's how what the traffic is, what obstacles are in the road. So 
that's another area I think uh, that's rich uh, for for exploration and work. Uh, Microsoft is pretty far ahead there um, in the, with their SLAM program. So it is it's a challenging problem. The, the big problem in the United States is that the the that we're sparsely populated here. The U.S. is not a crowded country. Like there's 300 million people, right? So it's it's not very crowded, and there are large areas where there's just roads and no cell phone towers or very faint cell phone signals. They have to improve the cellular infrastructure in order to make a complete autonomy uh, viable. Um, anyway, so that's there's two components that need to be in place, and that's one: the vehicles need to be equipped with the SLAM, and you also have to have a good connected radio network, a cellular network, LTE, or otherwise. So these are the the uh, two things that I want to talk about. I've got three other things that um, we can talk about, particularly with battery management uh, in electric vehicles. Now, um, all electric vehicles, with a ex few exceptions of early hybrids, have a lithium ion battery in them. And there are various chemistries of lithium ion batteries, um, and they vary in energy density, depending upon the chemistry. There are trade-offs. Um, a lithium ion battery is, is, a, is a great piece of hardware. And what makes it great is that uh, it has a constant voltage output until it's almost exhausted. So let's say it's, I'll just throw a number out there, three, point, three and a half volts or whatever it is. It stays at three and a half volts until it's almost completely discharged and then it drops off. The problem that you have, though, is knowing what the state of charge of that battery is, because there's no way to measure that. If you if the car wakes up and looks at the battery and say, it says there's three and a half volts on the battery, it doesn't know how much how many electrons or kilowatt hours are left in the battery. It's a it's a pretty big problem. Um, Tesla has a different chemistry in their Model Y and Model S than they do in their Model S and Model X. The Y and S have a chemistry which has issues with um, um, determining the state of charge of the battery. The Tesla recommends that you charge the vehicle every day. And the reason is they can't really keep track of the state of the charge of battery, so they can't estimate the range on the battery either. So this is this is the it, an issue. And, and in, in class, we, we have, at the end of our class I teach there, we do sort of a startup uh, pitch thing, and they have to choose from different subjects. I recommended yesterday that someone really look at this. You could build a company on based on um, the lithium ion um, state of charge, and if you had something clever and sell that. Now, it, there's different ways of doing it. One is to purely look at the battery voltage, which is what everyone does. And then the, the other way to do it is to have what's known as a Coulomb counter, a charge measure that measures the charge that's flowing out of the battery. Um, into the controller for the electric motor. Um, so how can AI play a role in this? Well, uh, I don't think it's a, in, in an area that it, you have to apply big guns like AI um, that you would have to apply for route optim optimization and guidance or autonomy. It's, it's an area that um, is um, more inclined to just standard coding techniques and standard software and not uh, heavily dependent on AI, although it's a great buzzword uh, to use for this. It's just uh, um, not uh, conducive to simple battery modeling. On battery modeling and aging, uh, there's people have done this before. The batteries do behave very differently depending upon temperature and so forth. And and so uh, this is these things are pretty well known right now. Um, but I think the um, state of charge is a ripe opportunity. The state of charge means how many kilowatt hours are left in the battery. Um, and so there, there's ripe opportunity uh, there for a company to, to build um, you know, content, to sell all content for. If, if I were to build a company now, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't focus on a product per se. I, I would focus on a technology and cornering the intellectual property around it, the patents and so forth. And then, put that in a package and put it up for sale to someone and try to sell it. So if this is the crowd here, their technical crowd here. So if there was this type of crowd that was interested in the business aspect, that that's the part that I would, you know, I think that this is what I would do. So um, 
let's talk a little bit about electric motors because I'm I'm deeply familiar with that and the control stuff. Um, uh, uh, electric motor has what it does is it takes electrical energy in the form of electrons and converts it to mechanical power. It's it's one of the few devices that can actually do this, take electrical and convert it directly to mechanical power. In general, an electric motor, uh, a simple electric motor, like you'd find in a toothbrush, electric toothbrush, runs about 50% efficiency. In other words, for every kilowatt you put into it, you get a half a kilowatt out. So you get you put a thousand watts into it, the amount of mechanical energy you get out is 500 watts. That's for that type of motor. For other types of motors, talk about the one that's in the Model S, which is an induction motor. They have two types in there, but let's talk about the induction. The induction motor is, is invented by Tesla, uh, the great engineer. Um, that runs about 90% of it, 90 to 95% efficiency. So if you put a thousand watts into it, you get the mechanical work you get out of it is 950 watts. You can see the leap and that's a leap in technology. However, an induction motor cannot be driven without a computer. It has to have a computer and power electronics hooked to it. Um, so this is the this is the difference between a simple motor like in a toothbrush and the one that you would have in the Model S, which is an induction motor. There's two other, other types of electric motors that are used in electric vehicles. One is called a synchronous, synchronous reluctance motor. Okay, that's in Toyota's hybrids. Uh, it's also in the new Teslas and the Lucid uh, um, vehicle. The Lucid's a company that makes electric vehicles like Tesla, but they're very small. They're not very big right now. They use a synchronous reluctance motor. This has many advantages. Um, an electric motor, it does. It, it works two ways. When you put mechanical power into the electric motor, like you drive the electric motor with a wheel or a gear, out comes electrical power. It works both ways. It converts electrical power to mechanical energy and mechanical energy into electric, electrical energy. It works both ways. So for instance, when you're on the road and, and driving and you go downhill in a Model S, the, the, the energy that's inside the car contained in mechanical energy, like for, just from virtue of motion or gravity, starts charging the battery. That's called regen, regenerative. Uh, effect. So it's taking the mechanical energy and converting it back to electrical at a 90% efficiency, 90 to 95% efficiency on the induction motor. Um, if you were going to produce a company, uh, the electric the area of electric motors is ripe for innovation right now. Uh, hitting 90% efficiency, which is Tesla's claim, and I think it is accurate, is very difficult to do. That's that's challenging to do. And that if you want, you, there's room right now for for being able to um, turn uh, magnets off in motors and so forth like that. Inside an electric motor, there are magnets, with the exception of the induction motor, which doesn't have magnets, electromagnets, but it has magnets inside of it. And the problem with with the electric motors that have magnets in them is that it has this thing called back EMF, which is electromotive force that comes out back out of the light. It's the electrical energy. You can't turn that off. It's always present. It's a function of the motor speed, how fast the motor's turning. It's how much energy that comes out of it. So you really can't uh, do anything about that. It'd be ripe for innovation and a, a great company to start would be, or intellectual property development would be to, to turn that off, turn the back EMF off. And this is one of the things that we talk about at Berkeley is how we can mitigate the back EMF problem because sometimes you don't want the vehicle to convert mechanical power to electrical power. You want it just to turn everything off. And you really can't do that um, with a motor that has ba uh, ba uh, magnets in it. So, um, and so the synchronous reluctance motor is, is, is the one that uh, Tesla is using in the model, the new Model S. Tesla has two motors in the Model S, has an induction motor, has a, and then it has a synchronous reluctance motor. The inductance motor uh, is the synchronous reluctance motor is, is high torque, has a high lot, a lot of starting torque and starting power. The inductance motor has high starting torque and high, high power, but not like the reluctance motor. So for cruising, you use the inductant inductive induction motor. And for acceleration and city driving, you switch to a different motor. It has two motors in it. And it's complex control 
uh, Tesla is very far ahead in the area of um, battery management control algorithms. I mean, I mean, it's like 10 years now they've been on working on the model. The model S has been in development 10 years. They're very, very far ahead and they have an edge. Um, with a few exceptions, they probably have the biggest edge right now and, and range too. For Range means how far you can drive on a full charge. So let's say if you have a flashlight and you put batteries in your flashlight and you turn the flashlight on, how long does it stay on? So Tesla has a, an edge for a hundred kilowatt hour battery, which is a thousand pound battery that's in the Model S, you get about 300 miles. Pretty good for a car that weighs about five or 6,000 pounds. For the Chevy Bolt, which is another EV, um, they have a 64 kilowatt hour battery and a range of 260 miles. So it's a range thing. Who has or has? It's a range war. Whoever has the greatest range, uh, best aerodynamic efficiency, and lowest least rolling friction, it wins. So one of the things that I asked the class to do is to improve a car. How do you make a car more efficient? And if you can get Tesla claims ninety percent efficiency. As a matter of fact, I did all of the math and and all of the software to determine that that's in fact true they are telling the truth we what we did is we took a chevy bolt and we hacked into the computer on a chevy bolt um, with some software and we were able to extract exactly what the car is doing and then we drive it around on the highway and we drive it uphill and downhill and so forth and we compiled uh files uh, of data on what exactly how efficient it is and, and exactly how it's behaving. And, and it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's nice to see a car with a you know a nice software interface like that. So we took this and we created a, a some did some R and D in class with the students to determine um, how it would be improved. And there's a couple areas. One is improving the tires. If if you had a tire with a lower, the tire when it rolls on the ground generates friction and it's not insignificant, it's a lot. Um, it, it's a cubic function of the velocity. So the power that required that the tires eat up out of the battery that's lost on friction is a cubic of the velocity. So I asked the students and this is part of their pitch, it's like, how, do you, how are you going to improve? Maybe improving the tire design now there's an opportunity for a comp uh, you know for a company there is how to have the students think about improving the rolling friction coefficient making the rolling co friction coefficient smaller uh the biggest the biggest power sink on a car and an EV is aerodynamic drag it's the largest component if there were no drag and no rolling friction the car on flat ground wouldn't use any power but there is and aerodynamic drag is the largest predator of, of battery energy. So um, I asked them to improve that. There's there's lots of room to improve. Uh, Tesla claims the Model S, I'm gonna quote this, has 25.5 square feet of uh, frontal area and a drag coefficient of 0.23. Is this true? Well, we drove the Tesla on flat ground, and it is true. They do have that. We back calculated using the models for uh, the aerodynamic models. That it's a there's an aerodynamic mathematical model that's available in a textbook of the of the vehicle, uh, and in fact, that's true. So it appears that uh, it seems like the Tesla is boasting about the, the car, but in fact, it, it turns out that everything they said about it was in fact true. Um, Chevy Bolt's drag coefficients are much higher. Um, it's got really bad aerodynamics. Uh, why would you do that? Why would you build a car with bad aerodynamics, especially if it's a range thing? So the students can improve by changing the body shape, by putting different shapes on it, possibly. Um, there's proposals to do that or changing the, the outlook on it, the car, removing the, the mirrors on the side of a car, the side mirrors that you look out those generate a lot of aerodynamic drag. And why not put cameras out there, little camera modules in the, in the mirrors and just put a display there. It turns out you can't do that in the United States. It's against the law, but not in Europe. But there's an opportunity there for uh, a person to make improvements to the way vehicles um, you know, can, can be, get better range. 
Um, finally, uh, pass passenger safety and comfort. Um, I have a I have a Model Y a Tesla. I also have a Chevy Bolt, but I got a Model Y. It's my least favorite car. Um, there's a couple issues with it. One, it's got a a glass roof. It's all glass, and when it's hot, it's hot here. And where I live, it's, it's blistering hot. And it was 112 here for a week, and so that's not uncommon. It is it is uncommon, but it happens a lot. <laughs> that makes sense. The car is like a sitting, you're sitting in a, getting baked by the sun in there. That's the first thing. There's no start button. Like they didn't review ergos. Like you reach down and you want to start. Oh, you, there's no button that says start. You have to pull out a card and wave it over the console. And then maybe it'll turn on for you. It's just a strange, strange thing. And lastly, the center display. I don't like that. You have to look over to the right to see how fast you're going. It takes your eyes off the road. And even adjusting the mirrors on it is difficult. If you're going to make a car, people are familiar with cars the way they're familiar with them. They have a start button. They have a speedometer and a display right in front where you can see. You don't have to take your eyes off the road. Um, that's what I want. And I also want to be able to, to adjust the mirrors from a button on the door, not reaching over onto a touch screen and sliding, when, you know, uh, tabbing over and trying to find the, the mirror adjustment. So... But that's the choice that Tesla made. That's just it's a it's an aesthetics, I think, and it's it's not particularly convenient. Um, but they, I think that you know uh, safety. I I don't think the Tesla a heads up display, where the, the the dash and the speed at speedometer and the other gauges are displayed on the windshield would be very useful. So you don't have to take your eyes off the road. So um, the autonomous part of uh, Tesla is uh, okay. Uh, there are plenty of videos online of Teslas running into things uh, that, you know, when they're doing testing, like they'll put out a, 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 a pardon me, child-sized piece of material and see if it can not hit it and it hits it. So there's a lot of work to be done and Tesla's choice in autonomy is very different than other people have taken. So I hope that answers your question. I can, I can take some questions in the chat now. Uh, do we have questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly if you want. Actually, I, I have a question. Uh, what, what is the state of autonomy? You, you know, like, because some people say, okay, we will achieve like full autonomy, in, let's say in, like five to 10 years from now, some people say, yeah. oh, it's, it's impossible to achieve. It will take much longer. And yeah. what, what, what is really, what is the state of autonomy today? And what do you think, is it possible you, to achieve real I, autonomy? I don't, I don't know if you get car sick. I don't, but a lot of people do, unless they're driving. So one of the problems is that it, if you have a fully autonomous vehicle and you're looking down at your phone or your laptop, but your body's moving around, it, it makes you nauseous. So that's a problem right now. How to how to how to mitigate vestibular illness when you're driving. So that is a problem. What is the state? I think it's still still too early. And and I mentioned the SLAM simultaneous localization and mapping is the most useful thing. Uh, I don't know why people aren't doing that. I'm not sure that Tesla is not doing that, but I don't think they are. Um, I, I think it's just it's in it, it's early. It, it's it's really convenient though to be like if you ha have a car. You know, and your car, my car sits out in the sun here for eight or nine hours a day, not being utilized, an asset that I have that I can't utilize. It'd be nice to be able to like sh share a vehicle with someone like you, you, you pick up your the mobile device, you type, take me here, and your car just magically shows up. You get in it and it drives you there. And then you don't have to worry about parking it or anything else, just drops you off and go. And then it, somebody else co owns that with you. So to answer your question, it's just not there yet. It's it's a long ways off, and, and there's a lot of people working on it. It's a very expensive uh, development process with a lot of sensors, a lot of technology, um, cameras, radar, all, all these components. Uh, it's just uh, different companies are taking different approaches with it, and Tesla's approach is different than you know General Motors program, which is different than Hyundai's program. They're all you know, different ways of doing this. There's not a standardized, you know, autonomy system, you know, like 
beacons on the roadway or whatever it is that everyone can share. There's nothing like that right now. So yeah, that's the state of it. And it's a, it's a long ways off. And it's it's right now it's it's still early. It's still still only been working on it about six or seven years now. So it's still still early. And I assume yeah. with the upcoming recession and you know probably many self-driving car companies won't be able to either raise money or you yeah. know struggle right uh, well the down the downside of the recession is that people's um, investment income um, has a lot of people have lost half right uh, that takes money out of the pool for people to risk I mean, they did nothing. They had a million dollars and they looked in their account one day as $500,000. And now they're scared. They're like, oh, what's going to happen next? You're going to lose another half of that? Are you going to lose a half again? So that you're right. It, people are nervous about investing in um, without the flow of cash uh, that needs that would need to, and it's expensive. Well, that's, that's quite frankly, what do we, we, we burned the Oculus, we burned through a hundred million in a year. And that's just a little VR headset. You know, so it's a it's that's yeah, a very expensive proposition. It it couldn't. It, the only way I could see that getting done is through some sort of government funding or something like that, where there, we have a lot of capital available. The government's a prime beneficiary of that, I would think. So I, I think that that's the you know that would be a challenge to um, have uh, um, a company be you know funded. Um, you look Andreessen Horowitz and the companies like that. They buy a company. And they IPO it or they flip it, right? They're going to buy the asset. They they're connected. They know everybody. They send mm -hmm. their guy in for us. They send in a guy that worked at Jason Horowitz, a principal guy, in to talk to directly to Mark Zuckerberg. You have to have that uh, aspect of it in place. And if you don't have that, you're not connected. You don't have the capital available to you. It's just really tough. It's a long haul investment, and it's going to take a company with very large assets. Uh, to do that, you don't hear Elon Musk talking about autonomy, Dutch, do you? You don't really say too much about that. I mean, he's talking about Twitter right now, but um, investing in companies and new stuff is very risky. I, I brought up the Twitter example because I wanted to come back to that. Twitter has is, is bled investor money for years. I know they brag about the revenue, but that's not the profit. Profit is what the company makes. They have a revenue growth, but they don't have a profit growth. And what kind of business is that? Some hot dog stands make more than Twitter do. You know, there's a little hamburger stand out in town or something. <laughs> makes more money than Twitter, even though Twitter has 10,000 employees or whatever it is, so it did. But, um, you know, th this is a problem. And um, the, with, you're right. The recession coming, people are going to be very careful. They're not as careless with their money. And then, you know, FTX, a Bitcoin thing that imploded Bitcoin's, mm -hmm. you know, Crypto, not Bitcoin, but crypto is sort of dangerous now. You know, it was always dangerous in my view, but it's very dangerous now. And it's got people scared. So investors are scared. It really does hurt the universities and private schools and so forth because people like me, I donate money to Berkeley, right? People like me um, are nervous and they're they're scared now. I'm not scared really, but I'm just saying. Everyone's like, wow, where's the, what happened to our money supply from all the donors? Well, everyone's money supply shrunk. 50% some people lost half. So this is the this is the thing. So uh without that huge pool of capital, I don't know what's gonna happen. I honestly don't. So in the in the beginning of your talk, you said Facebook did right and um Twitter did many things wrong. I'm just curious what exactly well, Twitter did wrong early days. Here's the thing. It, it they sell ads, they sell your data too, but they they get revenue from ads from companies like General Mills and other things coming in there and putting ads up. Now, if your ad is next to a politician who curses and swears and talks to other people, it's just bad for your company. You don't want to be the next Twitter feed below some guy who's telling dang nasty things about people. You don't want that. I don't blame Twitter for banning those people because it hurts their revenue stream. It does. The advertisers are going, what are you guys doing? Why is this person on there? You know, I, I'm not saying it's right to do it to ban people like that. I don't think personally, I don't think it is, but I'm just saying um, they, 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 Twitter has become a, a fight. Uh, it's like everyone fights with each other there and it's just bad for advertisers. And Facebook 
has done a really good job of mitigating that. I know people say it's censorship and so forth, but they try to control that so that they have a platform that they can sell advertising on. And uh, Twitter, face uh, Twitter has made a series of mistakes. They bought Vine, a company. Vine is a, a is a short video company, and they utterly destroyed it. And it was around before TikTok. TikTok was modeled a little bit af after Vine. I thought it was a great idea. Guys at Bike Dance, you know, hey, why don't we do that here? But uh, they destroyed that. They've and, and they've destroyed a whole, whole series of bad whole series of bad decisions. They hired a CEO who was a software engineer there. He had been at the company since 2011, had no business experience. They went in and appointed him uh, to, to, to the CEO and he didn't know what he was doing. So that is not what t Facebook has done. Facebook had Sheryl Sandberg. Sheryl Sandberg's awesome. I mean, you know, finance stuff, just, just great, great leadership. You can say what you want about Mark Zuckerberg. I'm going to disagree with you. I think Mark Zuckerberg's done an amazing job. Compare the profit and revenue and growth of Twitter to Facebook. It's almost 10 to one. So that's what I what I was sort of getting at there is like, you know, people complain about them removing people from their app, but the advertisers are complaining about them. You know, why do you have this guy on here? He's a hateful person. You know, we don't want to do ads here. You know, that's that's kind of like that. And and I think Elon Musk needs to fix that. He he will. I think the guy's like he's pretty amazing. I know a lot of people don't think he's a bit of a wacko, but he. He he will fix that. He'll figure it out. And he's bought some people back that he can. It's probably, you know, season. You don't go into a company and fire everyone because you, you've got some experienced people there. You need them. They know how everything works. Keep them aboard, you know, get them to change their ways or whatever, but don't can them like that. I think that was for show. And now he's trying to hire those guys back. I don't blame him for firing the CEO, though. That guys, you know, when doing a good job, didn't know what he's doing. Uh, and so this is this is the issue with that. And, and you know, I was just, before I this is totally unrelated to what we talked about today, I was looking into this and looking at the growth of Facebook. I'm not saying they made a good decision with Meta. I think Horizon World is a disaster. I just it's my humble opinion. I don't know if Do you've you seen the metaverse thing or what? It, meta, metaverse that yeah, it's just not. It's I'm a video game guy. I know that world, and it's just not video game stuff. It's just not sellable stuff right now. So. Uh, it, but I'm not saying they made a good decision, but everything else that Zuckerberg has done has been a really good decision making. He's grown the company exponentially. Not, now, not a lot, people, a lot of people don't like him. I'm just saying I like him or not, but I'm just saying I'm glad he bought my company. But you compare that, you contrast Dorsey's performance at Twitter to Zuckerberg's performance at Facebook, and it's undeniable that, face, that Zuckerberg has done a spectacular job. He's hit a bump, a bump or two, so right it's basically trade-off if we if we talk about like real uh freedom of speech where everyone is free to express their opinion and the, those opinions could be very very diverse mm -hmm. right and if we're talking about like sort of censoring or sort of censoring certain opinions that are not uh, fit the agenda that then um it's like a trade-off. What what do you want? If you want to build like successful business and attract advertisers, yeah. right? It's yeah, like you want it. You want you want to attract advertisers yeah. to sell products, to bring revenue into the company. That is your job. It's not to have an agenda. You said the agenda. It's not. You're, it's not an agenda. That they were going to be moving, you know, sociopathic, crazy people off the platform because they're turning their customers off. The customers add add people. You know. That's it. And, you know, like violence and stuff like that's just not acceptable. It turns turns the it tur if you're an advertiser, that would turn me off. I'm not going to be on that platform. It's out of control. Let's find another means to spend our money on ads. Let's put it on whatever YouTube or whatever, you you know. So y YouTube is very carefully cu uh, curated. It's much better than Twitter and, and others. It's the, cur the curation on it is pretty good. So this this is the thing, and you know, like there's kids and stuff too, like on on, on, twi on Twitter, and they see this stuff, and they go, "Wow, what's this guy talking about? This politician says these really negative things." I'm not saying any politician; they all kind of do that. So it's just a it's just it got out of control, and it dro drove ad advertisers away. And and what do you do? You're going to sell people's data, I guess. But most of the people there are bots, <laughs> so you can sell bot data. So I I just think it, you know I know I've digressed from our subject matter. Uh, but I, I wanted to use the Twitter example to tell what not to do when you start a company. It has to have a revenue growth plan 
or an IPO or exit and purchased by another company. Um, I'm focusing on the vehicle stuff, I would say um, the AI vehicle controls, uh, route optimization, it's ripe for innovation, autonomy, not so much, battery management, ripe for innovation. I mean, I would I would really drill in on that if I wanted to do a startup. Like, let's let's get the battery stuff nailed. And let's make the battery like when it's cold outside. Let's make the battery not so dependent on temperature. Things like that are. are and then Tesla will come along. And say, hey, those guys know what they're doing. Let's buy them. You know, here's a billion dollars. Whatever. Won't be a billion, but you know, um, passenger safety and comfort. I just wouldn't do what Tesla did with their interior ergonomics or anything like that. So. Uh, and, and I didn't mean to give my opinion so much, but thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak. Th th thanks a lot. And, and hopefully we can host another uh, talk with you and maybe talk about video games and metaverse sure. and all those kind of things, because I think it's like also a very interesting topic. Yeah. I'd love to. Thank you. Yeah. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.